So as would be expected, social media platforms are being used by some investor relations departments within public companies to get the word out about financial news developments that investors might want to know about today on Zippy Point. I'm Brock Romnick and I'm a big fan of you. So this vid guide deals with the question of can social media be used for investor relations purposes and how does that work with Regulation FD's public disclosure requirements? So even though the SEC's last batch of true interpretive guidance in this area came out in 2008 before social media truly became a thing, the SEC did issue guidance in 2013 to affirm that that 08 guidance does indeed apply to social media in the social media context. So as noted in my separate vid guide about how you apply Reg FD in the context of analyzing whether you can use your investor relations webpage as a sole source of IR news, a link to that vid guide is beneath this video. The SEC's 2008 guidance lists eight non-exclusive factors that you can apply to get comfortable or not about whether you can forego press releases and use your corporate website as your main source of financial news. Few companies have taken advantage of that guidance, have taken the plunge, because the SEC's guidance is a, is a little bit clunky, as I note in that vid guide. The SEC's 08 guidance does make clear that corporate blog postings would be analyzed in the same way as other web, you know, corporate website postings for purposes of, of Reg FD compliance. And then the SEC had this Section 21A report in, that they put out in 2013, that's at the SEC commission level, about Netflix and how companies should and should not be using Twitter and it basically reaffirmed the framework and principles that were outlined in the SEC's 2008 guidance and now applied it to social media, specifically the concept that the public should be alerted to the channels of recognized channels of distribution that a company will use to disseminate material information that applies equally to company disclosures made via social media. So one interesting anecdote, you don't really need to know this, but in the wake of that Netflix Section 21A report in 2013, Several dozen companies voluntarily filed Form 8K to identify all their social media channels that might be considered official corporate organs. This was not required by the SEC that they file these 8Ks, and the practice of doing that, of filing those 8Ks, died pretty soon thereafter. So social media is being used in several ways these days to disseminate financial news, the most common being just to note when an earnings release has been issued, when an earnings call is coming up. So here's an example of that from uh, T-Mobile. They're not live tweeting their, their earnings call. They're just notifying the public that an earnings call is coming up. From what I can tell, the IR departments at only a few companies have their own separate social media channels, ones that are separate from the company's own you know, corporate main channels. So the, those channels are used to really spread marketing messages to the company's customers, their clients. And so I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by this. And correct me if, if I'm, I'm wrong, but... There seems to even be fewer dedicated IR social media channels today than there were a few years ago. I haven't seen any studies, so this is my anecdotal cursory survey, but it indicates that some of the IR channels that used to be available have, have dried up for some reason. So score one for the conservative lawyers out there. You've won the day. As a lawyer responsible for ensuring compliance with the federal securities laws, you should be regularly checking in on the practices of your IR department the corporate communications department, ensuring that nothing that gets pushed out by them on social media needs to be filed as additional soliciting material if, if you're doing an offering or you're about to do an offering or bringing in the boat for an upcoming uh, shareholders meeting. Many companies now have social media policies and maybe a process for legal vetting is baked into those if, if your company has one. But even if it doesn't have a policy, you should definitely get involved and keep an eye out. If your company is one of the few that are involved in using social media for your quarterly earnings process. There are definitely steps that you can take to make sure you comply with FD, particularly if you're live tweeting an earnings call. In my opinion, the steps would include one, promoting the event with some notice, providing a link to the event well in advance, you know, at least a week in advance, letting investors know that you're going to be live tweeting, and then sending out a tweet the morning of the event and resending the link, uh, you know, that, the, that this earnings call is going to be going on later in the day. Consider assigning a hashtag for the event so that all tweets related to that particular earnings call can easily be found with it by a search on Twitter. It usually would be the company's stock symbol with the letter Q staying for quarter, and then the quarter in the year to which that earnings call pertains. A few companies that are live tweeting now, I don't see them using this kind of hashtag, but back in the day when more companies were live tweeting, some of them used that technique. Two, 
you want to re review, the lawyer wants to review all the live tweets in advance. The tweets should not be spontaneous. They should be prepared in advance and to ensure that they match the script for the earnings call, that there's nothing new in the tweets that, 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 that hasn't been uttered during the earnings call itself, that the context is appropriate, that you know it's hard to capture the full context of something that's tweeted due to the 280 character limit, and you only have 20, 280 characters. It used to be 140, but now it's 280 characters in a tweet. But then you could have multiple tweets to try to put it in context, but still it's, it's hard to do that. But to the extent you can try to get the 280 characters, try to get some context. And then you don't want to cherry pick only the good news from the earnings call, have that go on out as a tweet. So you want to make sure the bad news finds its way into the tweets too. So again, only the reviewed tweet should be live tweeted, nothing spontaneous, meaning nothing should be tweeted about the Q&A session that happens after the transcripted portion of the earnings call. Three, linking to a disclaimer, typically one of the first tweets during a, a, a series of live tweets for the earnings call should be a link to the forward-looking harbor disclaimer, or maybe it's the full disclaimer in the 280 characters. And then another one related to non-GAAP re re reconciliation. And any specific tweets you have that might contain forward-looking information, maybe you shouldn't be doing that anyways, should link to that disclaimer again. Four, consider sending a link out to any additional materials relating to the earnings call, such as a press release or anything else that happens to be mentioned that's part of perhaps your 8K filing on item 202 that's been disclosed in an appropriate disclosure channel. So just a few years ago, I heard that 50 companies were live tweeting their earnings call. I'm just guessing here, but I think that number has sh shrunk significantly. Uh, there's so many places you can go to get a transcript of the earnings calls. Although those transcripts don't have as much value for those investors that want real-time information as the earnings call itself, those Investors are probably listening to the earnings call rather than relying on live tweets, but maybe they like to rely on the live tweets. I don't know. I do worry that companies that are setting out live tweets during the earnings call. They lose the ability to control the story, the context. Let's say they're doing a series of three or four of them to put everything in context, but obviously what gets shared, what gets retweeted is out of the company's control. And so then that context will be lost. So it's a tough call for me as to whether live tweeting and earnings call has real value. It definitely enhances your visibility or exposure because the world, the world has moved on to social media as the way to communicate. The reality is, and you just simply can't control your message anymore once you put it out there. So how do you fit these old school ways of doing things into a 200 in character world? So let's look at a few examples of companies that are live tweeting their earnings calls. I guess Twitter would be the I don't know, the gold standard, the ones doing it most completely that I've seen right now. And here you see at the beginning of the day, they're letting people know a reminder that today we're going to be doing an earnings call. Let us know if you have questions. Actually, they, they say they want to hear from you. Then they have this forward looking safe harbor disclaimer right here. And I love the way they use humor. Try time for the dry but important disclaimer. And I have a separate vid guide about how to give the forward-looking safe harbor. And one of my recommendations is to use humor, make fun of the lawyers. And so then you'll see they've got about 50, 60, I didn't count these up, but they got a lot of tweets during their this earnings call. I think it's at least 50, but you get the idea here. Here's another company that occasionally does live tweeting at Cisco. Here's an announcement in the morning. We're gonna be doing our earnings call today. I do not see a disclaimer, by the way, but that's them. And there's only about five or six tweets about this, maybe seven or eight, but it's pretty good here. They're using graphics in, as embedded into their tweets, so it's much easier to read. I like the way they do that. And then Delta is one more of these. They're, and they, they, they're, they have a separate channel called News Hub in addition to their main corporate channel. So it's not quite investor relations, but it's similar. And here's the announcement about we're doing our live tweet today. And then there's about, again, they're using slides, although it's kind of hard. The font size is pretty small on these slides. But they got about six or seven live tweets. So this British study from 2019 notes that smaller companies are seeking to increase their liquidity, seeking investor attention, and they're more likely to use social media to reach potential investors with their financial news. That would make sense that smaller companies would leverage social media as much as they could. But are they really doing it here in the United States? I do not know. Uh, that study is just about companies in the UK. 
So if you've seen examples of smaller companies doing this, let us know or add a comment down if you're watching this on YouTube. So I'm not going to really get into the whole CEO social media channel thing, whether that should be recognized as a uh, channel of distribution as compared to the company's official corporate social channel. This is one of the issues in that 2013 Netflix situation. That CEO, Reed Hastings for Netflix, Netflix's CEO, was doing some postings on Facebook. So that was not the official Netflix Facebook account. That was his personal account. The bottom line for me is that it comes down to the facts and circumstances. Is there an expectation by investors that the CEO's Facebook account is delivering corporate news? Has the company taken the appropriate steps to let the market know that it will be using the CEO's social media account as a way to deliver its news? Has the company analyzed the eight non-exclusive factors in that in the SEC's 2008 guidance and gotten comfortable with how all that works. So let me know what you think. Mm -hmm.